Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Well, I want to talk with you today on the subject of freedom. Freedom! I was going to wear me cult and paint my... My face blue, oh, William Wallace, um, I promise it's the last time I'll do that this morning. Um, but uh, we're going to talk on, uh, on the subject of freedom, and the title of the message is Free Indeed. Everyone say free indeed. Free indeed. Free indeed. John chapter 8, starting at verse 31. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. There's a a progression here. Listen to what Jesus is saying. If you hold to my teaching, you therefore become my disciple. And then you will know the truth. And that truth, that'll set you free. But they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been slaves to anyone. For those of you who know the Bible quite well, has that ever caused you pause? I mean, the nation of Israel has been slave to everybody throughout history. Isn't it interesting how pride makes an appearance when we're confronted with truth? We are Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that? that we shall be set free. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. I don't know. It seems like there's this, there's this added uh, adjective at the end there, which is just clearly not necessary. Jesus, he, he says the word indeed, because in my mind, you're either free or you're not free. Because if you're only partially free, I would suggest that's not freedom. But Jesus doesn't say we're just free. He says, no, no, you're, you're going to be like, like really free. Free indeed. For if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word. Again, it is living, it's active, sharper than any two edged sword. It's the discerner of the hearts of men. Before it were laid bare, we're exposed. This morning, we pray that your word would find good soil in our hearts. We, as your church, as your gathering, as your people, we say that you are welcome here, not in a, in a general sense, but in a specific sense, into our hearts, into our thoughts, into our belief systems, into our behaviors, into our brokenness, into those burdens that we've walked in with this morning, with the chaos and the confusion. We say you are welcome here. So we do our best to push to the side every weight, every distraction and lean into what you're saying and speaking this morning. Freedom. It is for freedom that you're setting us free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. And so we pray this morning that we'd be awakened, that that word would come alive to us. That you said that we would know the truth and the truth would set us free. So would you reveal to us those things that maybe have been hidden because of our brokenness, because of our pain? Would you bring revelation this morning and life into those dark spaces and barren places as only you can? We're not here to G ourselves up this morning. We're here to allow you to come in and breathe life. So we pray that you might come and move in our hearts, in our lives in profound ways. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Free indeed. Our, our theme for the year for 2021, 
God has spoken over, over us is enlarge. Uh, it's a word that we read about in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 54, starting at verse 2. It says this, it says, enlarge the place of your tent. Now we've got to do something. We're the ones that are, that are having to do the enlarging here. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For then, for you will then spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. God's word over us is enlargement. As we make room for God, as as we enlarge, as we stretch, as we lengthen, as we strengthen, then God will move on our behalf and we will stretch out to the left and to the right. We will advance, we will move forward, we will grow, we will achieve that which God has for us. We will move forward. It was King David who said in Psalm chapter 18 verse 19, he says, for God you have brought me into a spacious place. It says he rescued me because he delighted in me. I just believe someone needs to hear that this morning. He delights in you. He loves you. Uh, he didn't bring you into a spacious place, a place of opportunity, a place of growth. He didn't bring you into that because you are good. Uh, no, he did it because he delights in you. He loves you. You're the object of his affection, the apple of his eye. But he brought us into a spacious place. And that, that, that word uh, spacious in the, the original uh, Hebrew is a word that means enlarge or enlargement. That God is bringing us into a place of enlargement. He has brought me. He is bringing you and I to a place of enlargement. Now, I don't know about you when you look at the world and what's going on around about us at the moment and then you stop and ponder the word enlarge. Maybe think, I don't know, Mike, if you got that word for 2021 quite right. When I look at what's going on around us, I'm not sure about enlargement. It's more like containment or lockdown. Imagine that for the year, for the theme of the year. God, I feel this God saying, this is the year of lockdown smaller, constricted, spacious place, more like isolated place or stay at home place. And when we look at what's going on around about us and at what's coming at us, it would appear that this is anything but a year of enlargement. But that word for us and over us is more about what Jesus is wanting to do in us and through us than what's happening around about us via the world. And it's exactly the same with that promise of freedom to us. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. That freedom is about what's going on in us despite and oftentimes in spite of what's going on around about us. This to me seems to be the hallmark of a lot of what Jesus talks about. That we often as human beings have this propensity that when we hear something is to project it outwards. Like that's a lovely sentiment, Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if all those people did it? How good would life be for me? And we do, if only God, you could fix them, everything would be great. I mean, maybe you prayed that prayer this morning. Don't look to your wife right now. Don't do that. That's cruel. Maybe you prayed, God, would you fix them? Would you change them? Would you remove them? Would you do that? And we push those things outward and seem, tend to automatically view those promises of God and those things that God's wanting to restore and renew in our lives. And we see them as more as things that are outward rather than inward. But God speaks into our very soul. He says things like that there's a peace that can transcend understanding. A peace that we can have when when everything's just bad. And so it seems that he's not interested in what's going on or changing what's going on out there. That peace is coming through another avenue. That peace isn't coming through pleasant circumstances sometimes but it's rather what's going on the inside. 
He promises us a peace that doesn't make logical sense, a peace that we shouldn't have in light of what we are encountering and experiencing in our lives. Because it's a peace that's not tied or shouldn't be tied to wavering circumstances, but to unchanging truth. The Jesus kind of truth, the truth that we would know and that truth that would set us free. Freedom, free indeed. He who the sun sets free is free. To fully understand and receive and live in that kind of freedom that Jesus offers us in him, the the kind of freedom that he is talking about here, a freedom that can exist even in contained circumstances. I just think there's just a, a number of us in the room this morning that just need to hear that. It's a freedom that exists even in contained circumstances. But to begin to understand that kind of freedom, we need to have a basic grasp on the difference between the Old and New Testaments. What was God doing then and what what is God doing now? How did God move then and how is God moving now? Because we can so often, all of us, I think, carry a New Testament mindset into the Old or bring an Old Testament understanding and view the New Testament through that lens. And that would be wrong, and it would bring confusion and misunderstanding. Because God's not working with us now how he worked with the nation of Israel back then. God's doing a a new thing. Now, same God, yes, absolutely. Jesus, the meta-narrative through the whole story, the golden thread, absolutely. But the two covenants, the two Testaments, the two agreements that God made with the nation of Israel and and that one that, that God extends to us today, I mean, they're completely different. Because in and through Jesus, God has done a new thing. Ray just led us through communion. It was Jesus on that night before he went to the cross, gathered together with his disciples and said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant. It's a new covenant. He's made a new agreement with us, his people. It's a new testament, a new covenant, a new agreement. A new agreement that God has made with us through what Jesus has done for us and on our behalf on the cross. With the new covenant being the better of the two. Much, much, much better. But hey, if you want to try and live up to the 600 plus laws, good luck. You can't. That's the point. That was the point of the law to show us that we can't. It was the Apostle Paul that wrote to the church in Rome and says that the law was our schoolmaster leading us to Jesus to show us that we can't do this in and of ourselves. So just in case you think you can, just go back um, and the law will reveal to you very quickly uh, that you but you can't, you can't do it. And unless you were a Jew, it, that, that covenant was never for you in the first place. See, the old covenant, the Old Testament was for one people group for a certain period of time. It always had an expiration date. It was always for a particular purpose and that was to lead us all to Jesus. Jew, and Gentile alike. This new covenant, we all get in on it. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. So Jesus arrives on the scene in history and starts talking to this nation of Israel, to the Jewish people primarily and those around, and starts to speak of the concept of freedom. Now, you've got to understand that this was extremely difficult for first generation Jesus followers and Jews of the day to get their head around what Jesus was talking about when he said freedom. Because all they've got is not Old Testament understanding, because to them, there's no old. There's just one, current. All they've got is a current understanding of who God is, 
and of how God operates. And it's very black and white. I mean, they've messed it up and they've added all their extra bits to it. But 600 plus laws that were handed down to Moses of how to live and how to get on in life and how to do, don't do that, do this. If you do that, this will happen. If you can, you can expect God to bless you if you do this. 600 plus laws to live up to. So here comes Jesus talking about freedom and kingdom. It's because the nation of Israel was well accustomed to persecution and war. They were used to bad people coming, coming in, foreign nations attacking them, and then God dealing with those enemies in fairly destructive and definitive ways. So freedom to them was mostly seen and experienced outwardly. as they were set free from literal, physical captivity. Like what we see time and time again throughout the Old Testament, I mean, one of the most spectacular ways we see that is uh, God led out the nation of Israel from Egyptian captivity in just spectacular fashion as he saved his people. Freedom meant something to these people. They're going in and hearing this with a particular mindset. That was their picture of freedom. And here comes Jesus speaking of freedom and the establishment of kingdom to a people group who are currently, as of right now, not not even looking back in history, right now are under Roman occupation and Roman rule in their own country. They are not running their own country. They are not making laws and decisions in their own country. They've been given some level of grace to live out their religious choices But the rule and reign was the Roman Empire. And they understandably assumed that Jesus was going to deal with these Romans in the same way that God had dealt with those kinds of people in seasons past and reestablish an earthly throne and kingdom. But this was so much bigger than that. Jesus was doing a new thing. And Jesus starts out his ministry in spectacular fashion, dropping a sermon that was for us today, but so incredibly more so to the audience back then, profoundly revolutionary. This was groundbreaking and incredibly controversial. His sermon on the mount. I mean, Jesus said things like this, if you can believe it. That you're blessed when you're persecuted. Now, some people leave it there. You might be persecuted for being stupid. You're not going to be blessed. Let's be clear on this. Persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed. Now, I've got my own definition of what it is to be blessed. And and persecution doesn't factor into it at all. In fact, I think if we were all to be honest, I think blessing would be more indicative of persecution being totally absent. From our lives, I would suggest that you're blessed. You don't want for anything. You're blessed. No one's picking on you. You're blessed. It's just, it's easy. That's, that's, that's blessed. But Jesus is no blessed when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. You're, you're blessed. I mean, let's be honest. Like, what? What? But Jesus, aren't you going to come in and destroy them? Like, you know, Jesus, like, they're our enemies, right? And you say you know God. I don't know how well you know God because we've kind of got this thing with God when other people come in and do bad things to us. God kind of, like, takes care of them for us, if you know what I mean. He kind of just gets it done, gets them out of our way so we can move forward in Him. Historically, that's what God's done with our enemies, Jesus. And then Jesus flips the script even more. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. I mean, I've heard there's churches, not here, but I've heard there's churches where, where people can't even love people in the church, in the same church that they attend. Love your enemies? And we read it like it's like, you know, yeah, it's kind of hard, but, but, but it's, it's not that hard. We kind of can easily read over it and be, be dismissive of it. 
Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Oh, pray for them, all right. Pray for those who persecute you. <laughs> that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the... What? Come on, you've thought it. What? They thought it. What are you doing? On the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And once again, it's important to make the distinction here. Uh, you, you go, why are the poor tax collectors singled, singled out? Once again, they're in Roman occupation. So you've got this hated nation of people that are inflicting pain upon the Jews. And then you've got people within your own countrymen that are working for the Romans, taking money from you. These were a despised people. They weren't just a random group singled out. These were the most hated people. And Jesus is saying, even those kinds of lo- those people that you think are losers are the worst of the worst, the scum of the earth, those betrayers. Even they know how to love like that, to love those that love them. I mean, that's, that's easy. They get that kind of love. And if you greet only people, and if you greet only your people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? But be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I mean, wow, that's, that's just crazy. That, that, that's crazy. That's crazy kind of love and diametrically opposed to everything that this people group has been accustomed to how God deals with people up until this very point. I mean, this is, what are you talking about, Jesus? See, because that whole you've, you've heard it said before thing that, that Jesus says a lot, particularly in the Sermon of the Mount, he says, you've heard it said before. There's a reason why this nation and this people group have heard it said before, because they grew up learning the first five books of the Bible, every, every one of them knowing the law of God inside and out. The reason that they'd heard this said before is because it was God's law. I mean, Jesus said, an eye for an eye. You know why, why that? That's not just a saying that someone come up with someday. That, that was the law that was passed down to Moses. So if someone pokes out your eye, you poke out their eye. That's the law. If someone harm, like breaks your donkey's leg, you go break their donkey's leg. And if they don't have a donkey, break their kid's leg. It's, 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 it can be similar sometimes. I was going to say husband or wife, but I wasn't going there. <laughs> but if someone did something to you, you were well within your God-given right to do the same thing back to them. So we look at this and go, you heard it said of old. Be very clear here. So this is a struggle. This is a wrestle that these people group are in. You've heard it said of old. Now Jesus is saying that which was once accepted is now unacceptable. Says who? Says you, Jesus. Well, God, on here, but that's, that's, not, that's not the God that we know. This was revolutionary. Freedom for them was seeing their oppressors, those out there, wiped out from the face of the earth. Not forgiving them, not loving them, not praying for them. That's crazy, Jesus. That's not freedom. I mean, can you put yourself in their shoes for a minute? This is just crazy talking, Jesus. This is the opposite of everything we've known up until now. Now, most of us, fortunately, in this room, don't have a first-hand reference point for living under oppressive rule, save for a few Europeans and possibly some South Africans in the room. But this new Jesus concept of freedom is still sometimes really hard for even us to get our own heads and hearts around. Because we too often view freedom as something that is more outward, being released from something or someone of what's being done to us, rather than experiencing something internally and being released and set free from what's holding us inwardly. We miss the freedom that Jesus is talking about when we look to him to remove or move things or people out there. When he's looking to deposit something in here, 
when he's wanting to reveal to us a truth, a truth that would set us free. For we would know the truth and the truth would set us free. He who the Son sets free is not kind of free. He's free. He's free and free indeed. Now, don't get me wrong, we should speak up for injustice, absolutely. We should vote for our politicians accordingly to what we believe will bring God's best in our country, in our state. We should pray for the preservation of God-given freedoms, freedom of speech, association and movement, these God-given freedoms that are under attack even as we speak. We should pray for godly leadership. We should pray for the removal of bad leadership. We should pray that God would expose lies. We, pray, we should pray for that truth be seen. But if we are looking at what Jesus is saying when he speaks about freedom through that lens, we are missing what God is talking about and wanting to bring to us. Freedom is resting in the fact that God's got this even that we've got completely no idea how. That's freedom. Freedom is in trusting him alone, not another, not the government, not your husband, not your wife, in him alone. Freedom is not needing anything other than him. Not addicted to substances, relationships, the opinions of others, or even our own opinion and self-worth. Freedom is found in the person of Jesus Christ, trusting that he has got this and that we are accepted in, in him. Freedom is being forgiven and released from the power of sin. Freedom is not being bound inwardly, even though we might be bound outwardly. Freedom is, the, the Jesus kind of freedom is being able to sing in the midnight hour in a prison cell. Singing praise and glory to his name, even though we're outwardly uh, contained, inwardly we're free, like Paul and Silas. Able to sing, not bound inwardly, bound outwardly. That's freedom. Freedom is living the life that comes to us through the power and presence of Holy Spirit. Freedom is forgiveness. Freedom is generosity. Freedom is rest in the finished work of the cross. Freedom is knowing that I can't, but he can. That's freedom. Freedom is trust and surrender. Freedom is knowing God's got this and more specifically that God's got me. Because he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Freedom, the Jesus kind of freedom, isn't, isn't something that's... Not what he's talking about here in the Gospel of John isn't what we see expressed outwardly, but what we express inwardly. At some point in time, I really want to talk on the theology of that God's in control. I think we've got some misunderstandings of what it means to say that God's in control. God most certainly is in control, but we've got this whole free will thing that we've got to try and reconcile with. So we can say that God is in control and pray that God would stop Justin from saying, uh, stop going around saying Michael's good looking all the time. Now, now God, God's not going to reach down from heaven and put his hand over Justin's mouth. Justin's got free will and choice. I think sometimes we've got a misunderstanding of what it means to say that God's in control. So when God comes to us about freedom, that the new covenant that Jesus is ushering in is more about what's going on inside of us than what's going on around about us. That Jesus cares what's happening to you. He cares very much what's happening to you. He wants to hear about what's happening to you. He wants to hear about how that's affecting you, or how, it's, how it's affecting your faith, how it's affecting your relationships. He wants to take those burdens off you. He wants to lead you in the truth. He wants to bring you out of it but bring you out of it, not necessarily out of the situations. I mean, when we talk about, do you not think that Christians in the Middle East are praying that they would stop being killed? And yet God is sovereign and God is in control. But we need to be clear about what we say. That God, this freedom that he is wanting to bring to us can be found in a Christian in the Middle East who's being persecuted with their faith. That's the kind of truth, that's the kind of freedom that will set you free. Free by not being led by what people may or may not do to you, say or say about you. That's the Jesus kind of freedom. Now I pray that God would protect my brothers and sisters all around the world. Absolutely. But he who the sun sets free is free indeed. If I give the worship team up. Jesus continued with this, this new radical idea of freedom in, in his famous sermon on the mountain, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. 
listen to this from a perspective of, might not be hard for some of us here today, from angst and worry where we feel like we've got to control the narrative and things are out of our control. And just listen to what Jesus is saying and speaking to us here. More, more, than, a, more, more than a provisional message, more than God's going to give you water. Now I've got water. Listen to what Jesus is saying here. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Oh, that's, that's freedom. What you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They, they don't sow or reap or store away. You don't have to hoard. Store away in barns and your heavenly Father feeds them. Uh, are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen to that. How freeing just to rest in the fact that, yeah, of course there's things that we've got to do in and amongst it all. And but we just sit back and go, God, you're going to, we've got to engage, absolutely. But to go, God, you've got this, that's freedom. To God, I don't have to, that's freedom. To God, you understand me, it doesn't matter if, if, if they don't, that's freedom. Because when we look at freedom through the lens of God's going to smash, crash his way through those people that are holding me and negatively impacting on my life, we miss the freedom that Jesus is so generously and lavishly wanting to give us. Free from our own brokenness to rest in him. Freedom is living in every area of our lives from the fact that Jesus has made a way. And we just need to trust that and walk in it. Now that's easier said than done sometimes, isn't it? But true nonetheless. And here's the wonderful thing, family. That freedom, that Jesus kind of freedom, that can't be taken from us. We can surrender it. We can give it away. We can throw it away. We can allow worry to overshadow it, but it, it can't be taken from us. Not that freedom. Because it's not circumstantial, it's supernatural. John chapter 8, and verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now I want to pray for a few groups of people here today. And, and, and I think we'd all fall into one or a few of these. And there'd be plenty more that I'm listing off this morning. I want to pray. And I just invite you right now just to bow your heads as we pray. Let's push aside every distraction, every weight, every thought, every concern as best as we could. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. Move in our hearts, move in our lives. I want to pray for freedom from addictions and brokenness. Freedom from unforgiveness. There's people here in the room this morning, you're bound up and you need to let it go. Freedom from lies that have been spoken over us by others or ourselves. Freedom from worry. Freedom from needing to be in control. Freedom from insecurities that are holding you back from expressing the image of God in your life. Freedom from sin. Freedom from pride and anger. There is a freedom for you today in Jesus, amen. We shall know the truth and the truth will set us free. 
because he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Father God, I just pray this morning as we just sit and rest in your presence. I pray for release. People's hearts, people's minds, brokenness. I pray you call those things to mind. Bring them to remembrance in people's lives. That you, those things that sometimes we've buried so deep for so long. We don't even recognize that it's causing us to walk with a limp. It's got us bound up, but you're wanting to bring freedom and wholeness and healing. I pray that in this space right now that you'd bring awakening. You'd awaken us to truth. Awaken us to revelation. Reveal your word to your people in a fresh way this morning. And more than in a general sense, in a specific sense, to every man, to every woman, to every child, to every heart, to every home, to every marriage, to every family, to every space, Lord God, where we are bound, no matter what it is, no matter where it's come from, would you bring illumination and revelation because you said that we would know your teachings and and, and that as we know truth, as truth is revealed, we would know the truth and that truth would set us free. I pray that truth be revealed in this place this morning, truth in people's hearts about your image over them as they've written themselves off, as they've accepted that what's been spoken over them. I pray, Lord God, that you're revealing truth, that they are a son and daughter of the most high God, that they are loved, that they are cherished, that you are for them, that you are faithful even when we are faithless. You are faithful. And we don't get it because we deserve it. We get it because you made a way. That because you took what we deserve, we now get what you deserved. Right standing with God. Free access to the Father. To be still and to know. I just believe that there's a fresh knowing, a fresh knowing coming to you. Not a knowing about, not, a, not, not, not second hand, third hand, but first hand. There's, there's, there's a knowing that's coming for you. But to know we need to be still, to give God time and space. It was only as the disciples gathered in the upper room to push aside distraction that Holy Spirit fell. Fire falls on prepared altars as we make room, as we make space, as we make way. Holy Spirit's wanting to come and bring fresh illumination. For too long you've been walking with that limb. For too long that's been holding you back. Not bound outwardly, but bound inwardly. But Jesus said, I'm coming to set at liberty those that are held captive. Not from oppressive rulers out there, but that oppressiveness inside. Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. 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 Setting at liberty, revealing truth. I pray that as we see it, as we sing, as we worship, I pray that there would be a, an awakening in your spirit. Christ, God, that you paid for to give us freedom and liberty. Awaken truth. Reveal. Set free. He who the Son sets free is free indeed.